Welcome to uh, the first screencast of Mr. Page, example number one. Uh, consider a thousand newton traffic light suspended by cores shown in the sketch and determine the tension in each of the three cords that are shown. So before we proceed on to this problem, let's just review what steps that we must take when we saw a free body diagram problem. So I've scrolled down to page six in our notes and it shows the steps that we will use when we solve free body diagrams. First of all, we draw a simple, neat diagram of the system. We pick a body, or maybe more than one, and we draw a free body diagram. Now, a free body diagram is basically a diagram that shows a chosen object itself free of its surroundings. And what we'll be doing is we're going to be drawing all the forces acting on the object, but also not be, to be careful not to draw any forces that it exerts on other objects. So you're drawing the external forces that are acting on the object. Once we draw the forces, which we use vectors to show those forces, we will then choose a convenient coordinate system. And then after that, we'll be applying Newton's first or second law. Now, at this point, we've only done equilibrium problems, so that would be basically Newton's first law, which we'll apply along the x and the y axes. And then once we start that up, then we'll start to solve the equations. So let's scroll back to the page uh, that we were using for an example number one. So here we are back to our problem, example one, and you can see the traffic light over here and we're going to draw a free body diagram for that. So let me draw it separately over here and there's my body. And now I'm going to draw the forces acting on that body and we have a force acting downwards, that's the force of gravity or the weight, and we have a force upwards and that would be our tension three. Now you may notice that I actually use a little dot at the center of my object and that's where I normally draw all the forces from. It's not actually where they're all acting, really the only force that's acting from the dot is the force of gravity, but uh, it's just very convenient to use a dot and draw all our forces le leaving there. So now this body is at rest, which means it's in equilibrium which means that the forces must balance each other out. So we can apply Newton's first law, which is the sum of the forces are equal to zero. Now, we have to choose a convenient coordinate system. And in this case, these two forces are acting vertically. So over here on the side, I'm just gonna label a little axis here and say Y going upwards is positive, And therefore, anything that's going downwards as a force will be negative. So over back to our, our sum of the forces equals zero, we're going to put a little subscript y here to indicate that we're going to add all the forces along the y axis and they'll all balance each other out and add up to zero. So we see two forces, tension three, that is up, plus we have the weight, which is going down, fg, which is equal to zero. And therefore you can just jump right straight to this and say that the tension three must be equal to the weight. And tension three, therefore, is equal to a thousand newtons because that was given over here in our problem. Now let's move on to finding tension one and tension two over here in our diagram and we're going to pick a body, in this case it's going to be this knot and show all the forces acting at that knot. So we have tension three going down and here I'm labeling it. There's tension three going down. And then we have tension two and three. Okay, and here is tension one going to about here. And then tension two is going way up to about here probably. Now you might be wondering, why did I know that tension one was the smallest one and tension two was larger than that and tension three is the largest of them all? To answer that question, I'm just going to show you this neat little trick that sometimes you can apply to just to show what are the relative sizes. So if you were to imagine that there was this tension upwards here that is basically this length is the same thing as that length and that tension one and tension two must vectorially add up to give this resultant force that's going to cancel out T3. And if you look closely here, 
got a little dotted line across and then a dotted line across. I'm applying basically the parallelogram method and we can see that tension 2 is actually larger than tension 1. And so sometimes you'll be asked on a conceptual type of question to rank the forces and you don't actually really need to go through and do the calculations. You should be able to look at the diagram and apply the parallelogram rule to find out what are the relative sizes of each other. And remember that the string length right here to the wall makes no difference in actually the tension. It's really drawing that result in force and coming up with a parallelogram method to figure out what these two forces are. So now that we've drawn the free body diagram for T1, T2, and T3, the next thing to do is to choose a convenient coordinate system. Now, normally we would usually make the x-axis horizontal, and I usually draw it right through that center point that we used for our free body diagram, and then our y-axis right through here. Now, if you don't want to draw it right on the diagram, you can also draw it on the side like I've done over here. The next thing I would also point out in this diagram is to label the angles that are given. So this angle here is 37 degrees, if you remember your alternate interior angles. And this angle over here is 53 degrees. And we'll be using that in a little bit. So now that we've set up our coordinate system, we've drawn our free body, di free body diagram for that knot, and we now can proceed on to applying Newton's first law, because this, again, is an equilibrium problem. And it's not accelerating, it's at rest. And so we're going to be applying Newton's first law along each of the axes that we have defined, which is basically we're going to be writing sum of the forces along the x-axis equals zero, and then we'll also be doing sum of the forces along the y-axis is zero. Okay, so let's then look at T1 and T2, but right now those two forces are neither along the x or y-axis, so what we'll have to do is to break them up into components. So what we're going to do is along the x-axis we're going to show T1x right here, that's T1x, and then along the y-axis we're going to show over here T1y, and we're basically breaking up T1 into two components, and we'll, we'll do a similar thing for T2. There's T2x, and then over here we have T2y. Now they actually should be on top of each other here, but I'm just drawing them a little bit separately so you can see. So now think of it as T2 is now being replaced with two components, T2x and T2y, and T1 is being replaced with T1x and T1y. So let's now look at that Newton's first law along the x-axis. And along the x-axis, we can see that T1x is going left and T2x is going right. And those two horizontal components are going to cancel each other out. So we're going to add the forces along the x-axis. That's T2x plus negative of T1x. And you hopefully will realize I'm putting a negative because T1x is pointing left. That's why we have to put a negative in here. So you can jump now to, to this point and say T2x must be equal to T1x. So the horizontal pull of T1 to the left and the horizontal pull of tension 2 to the right are basically canceling each other out. And we can write a similar equation for the tensions in the y direction. And you'll notice that there's two vertical components from string 1 and string 2 going upwards, and then there's tension 3 that is going downwards. So should we be able to write a statement with these three forces? So tension 1, y, in the y direction, upwards, then tension 2, y, upwards, plus the negative tension 3 because that force is going downwards. Or you can just stop, write t1y plus t2y equals t3 which is actually equal to a thousand newtons.
Now at this point we need to basically take T1x and T2x and T1y and T2y and write it in terms of the resultants T1 and T2 and the angles that are given 37 and 53. So walk you through this by basically drawing triangles. A triangle that relates T1 with its x component and its y component. So let me draw a little triangle here over down to the left side. So there's T1 and now I'm going to show the x component of T1. There's T1x and then the y component there's T1y. So this is a right angle in here and this angle here is 37 and let me just maybe re-outline that triangle once more here. That. So if we want to write a trig ratio that involved T1x and T1 and using 37, you'll notice that this is the adjacent side and this is the hypotenuse, so that would involve cosine. So over here, I'll just maybe just show you some of that trig ratios. The cosine of 37 equals T1x over T1. So T1x is equal to T1 cosine 37. And then we can also say sine 37 equals T1y over T1. And so T1y equals T1 times sine 37. And now we're going to substitute T1x in over here. That's T1 times the cosine of 37. And then over here for T1y, we'll write T1 sine 37. And hopefully you can see the same thing can apply over here with this triangle with T2. So for T2x, that's going to be, this is the adjacent side, and that's the hypotenuse. T2x is going to be basically T2 times the cosine of 53. And then T2y will be T2 times the sine 53. And this is equal to 1,000. Now you should notice that these, we have two equations here. We have an equation with T1 here and a T1 here, and an equation with T2 here and T2 here. So really we have two equations and two unknowns. So now this is really a process of substitution or whatever method you choose to use. I'm going to use substitution. So I'm going to take the equation on the left side. This is the best one to work with by basically putting one variable by itself. So T2 would be equal to T1 times cosine 37 all divided by cosine 53. Let's call that equation 1 and this is equation 2. And we're going to substitute equation 1 into 2. And we'll get something like this. T1 sine 37 plus brackets T1 cosine 37 over cosine 53 times sine 53 equals 1,000. And now you'll notice that we have an equation with just one unknown. So at this point it's really just getting like terms. You're going to add this number plus all of that number and basically divide it at the thousand by this num the numbers that when you get this added up here. So now you're just gonna have to get your calculator and do that. So uh, sine 37 is 0 0.602 T1 plus cosine 37 times the tan, actually, if you want to look at that as tan, sine over cos, tan of 53 is 1.06 T1s equals 1,000. And so if you add that to 0 0.602, you're going to get 1.66 T1, which is equal to 1,000. And then if you divide 1,000 by that, you're going to get T1 equals 602 newtons approximately. So there's T1. By the way, we had T3 over here. I'll just put a box there. And now to get T2, 
all we need to do is just basically substitute that back into any of the one of the equations. So I think the best one to work with would be just substituting back into t, the first equation. So t2 equals, I'm going basically, basically putting that in there, and 602 newtons times the cosine of 37 divided by the cosine of 53. And that will be equal to 799 newtons. And there's your other answer. Now there is an easier way to do this, and let me just pull this out on a separate little sheet so that you can see what I'm doing here. Okay, so here's the example drawn on a separate page, and I wanted to show you a much quicker way of working with this problem, but it really only works with three vectors. I mean, you could work with more vectors, but then it gets more complicated, and I think the method that we used earlier is much better to use for four or five or more vectors. So this particular problem was an equilibrium problem, which we applied Newton's first law sum of the forces, but you'll notice I'll be using a vector sign on my forces equals zero. There are three forces that if we add vector t1 plus vector t2 plus vector t3, they should add up to zero. Now, I hope that you do understand that these are vectors. So if you wrote t1 plus t2 plus t3 equals zero, this would in fact be wrong because you're not simply going to add up all the numbers and they add up to zero. So what we want to do is actually draw a vector diagram with t1, t2, and t3. Let me draw the vector diagram, actually, for the, or the free body diagram first, and then we'll get into the vector diagram. So there is the vector diagram, the free body diagram t1, t2, and t3. And now what I want to do is show them being added up and coming back to zero, which means basically if you looked at this as displacements, if you went this direction, t1, and then along t2, and then followed by t3, then you would end up exactly where you started. So we should draw something like that, and it'll turn out to be a triangle. So here's t1. I'm just going to draw it a little bit larger so you can see it. There's t1. Then I'm using the tip to tail method. I'm drawing t2 now. And then let's add T3, which is a vertical straight line. And if you've done everything right, then T3 should come back exactly where you started with. Now, we also want to label some angles in here. So over here, the little dotted line, this angle here, if you remember, that's right over here, that's actually 37. And then T2, that angle here, it's this angle right in here, that's the same as, that's really 53. And then also, since this is 37, this is also 37. And so hopefully you'll realize this is actually 90 degrees, which makes the problem really nice. And we know the size or the magnitude of T3, that is 1,000 newtons. So let me redraw this triangle over here once more so you get the idea and maybe not with all the clutter here. So there's our right triangle. And we know this side, which is 1,000, which is T3. And we're looking for T2. And we're looking for T1. And this angle in here must be what? Oh, well, 90 minus 37 must be. 53. So right now all you need to do is just apply your right triangle trig. So for example, if I want to find T1, which is the adjacent side, and the hypotenuse is T3, I would use cosine. The cosine of 53 degrees equals T1 over 1,000 newtons. And actually I can apply a similar idea with the other one. So this is 1,000 times cosine 53 and boom, you get your answer, which is 1,000 times cosine 53 on my calculator. That's 602 newtons. 
And for t2, we'll use sine 53, which is equal to t2 over 1,000 newtons. t2 equals 1,000 times sine 53, and that gives us 799 newtons. And there's t3 was 1,000 newtons. So there you go, much, much faster. But you should realize that this method is very convenient when you have three forces, but if you ended up with four strings or five, you know, lots of forces, then it would be a lot harder doing this sort of triangular method. So I don't always show this method, um, or I don't always use it in class, because it's uh, somewhat limited, and the component method for me always works.